This is Naked Mormonism. I pledge my life, all that I may have. I will strive to the utmost of my ability to be what you would want me to be. It's time to find the truth. That is, man lived before he came to this earth. He is an eternal being. Jesus, uh, Joseph Smith gave to the world the true understanding of the origin of man. That man comes to earth with a divine and eternal purpose. Let's examine church doctrine. And through it, all who believe and obey the glorious gospel of God, all who are true and faithful and overcome the world, all who suffer for Christ and his word, all of it, all shall become as their maker and sit with him on his throne and reign with him forever in everlasting glory. And see what it has to offer. And having set our hand to the plow, we will never look back until this work is finished and love of God and neighbor rules the world. In the name of Jesus Christ. What can be gleaned from Mormon teachings? A corollary to the pernicious falsehood that God is dead is the equally pernicious doctrine that there is no devil. Satan himself is the father of both of these lies. To believe them is to surrender to him. Where is the church heading? I have faith that the Constitution will be saved as prophesied by Joseph Smith. But it will not be saved in Washington. It will be saved by enlightened members of this church. The explicit tag is there for a reason. So if you get offended at what's said, it's not for you. But most importantly... May you ponder the truths you've heard. May they help you become even better than you were. Skepticize everything. Oh, yeah. The evening of June 27th, 1844, in Carthage, Illinois, was a fateful one. This is a story many of us have heard dozens of times in church. It's a faith-promoting tale of martyrdom and sacrifice and the beginning of the last dispensation sealed by the anointed blood of a messianic figure. Joseph Smith, the founding prophet of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, died a martyr for what he believed. Long shall his blood, which was shed by assassins, stain Illinois while the earth lauds his fame. Almost any Mormon can tell you the story of Carthage Jail, while simultaneously knowing almost nothing about it. Even historians who extensively study Nauvoo history will often lay the blame of the assassinations on religious intolerance. This is pure propaganda to push a religious agenda. What happened to Joseph and Hiram Smith that day was a symptom of ills that we see around us every day. The lack of ability for the legal system to curtail flagrant and unapologetic despotism, coupled with lynch mob rule, executing vigilante justice when they perceived no other remedy in the adolescent legal system of American democracy. The trappings of mob rule and vigilante justice are foundational aspects of majority rule Americanism, and the victims are diverse and often subjugated people. Rarely is the victim of a lynch mob one of the most powerful men in the country, but the story of Joseph Smith's death presents many irregularities for us to contend with today. This is also a story that I've wanted to tell for years. Most episodes of this podcast focus on one or two consequential documents or sources to discuss individual stories in Mormon history and their relevance to the greater historical timeline. Each of those stories has led to this point where there are dozens of sources to pull from. There are some discrepancies in some of these sources, but I've done my best to basically harmonize those discrepancies where they can be reconciled, and I'll discuss discrepancies where the sources can't be reconciled. So let's begin. 
The sun sank closer to the horizon west of Carthage. The shadows became longer. The blue sky turned hues of yellow, red, and orange. Tensions remained high among the citizens of the city. Brigadier General Deming, called a Jack Mormon by the Carthage Gray Militia, was personally appointed by Governor Thomas Ford to oversee the guard duties of the prisoners in Carthage jail. Joseph, Hiram Smith, John Taylor, and Willard Richards are prisoners. General Deming gave a task to a young boy named William Hamilton to sit on the roof of the city's courthouse, the tallest building, and to use a looking glass to keep a lookout for anybody who was entering the city, whether individual riders or entire groups of people. Now, William Hamilton grew up in Carthage, and his dad, Artois Hamilton, ran the city tavern, Hamilton's Hotel, and young William Hamilton could see for several miles in all directions from this vantage point atop the courthouse. Around 4 p.m., He spotted what looked to be a large group of men coming from the north. They were about two miles off, and they were coming toward Carthage on the road that leads from Nauvoo. William Hamilton was ordered to immediately report anything like this to Brigadier General Deming, which he did. And as soon as he told General Deming that a military force was on the north edge of town coming from the road to Nauvoo... A number of questions inevitably entered Deming's mind. (laughs) Were the Mormons coming to break the prophet out of jail? Were these vigilantes? Or were these men that were dispatched by Governor Ford after his arrival to Nauvoo for some other unknown purpose? There was no way to know until Deming could establish contact with this unidentified group of men. We don't know the details of what happened or what information was exchanged, but General Deming, whose sole task was to guard the prison fled. He left town, and he headed to the countryside, miles from Carthage. According to Governor Thomas Ford, Deming had, quote, orders to guard the town, observe the progress of events, and to retreat if menaced by a superior force, end quote. The number of Carthage greys that Deming had under his command was about 60 men. This unidentified force coming into Carthage from the road to Nauvoo outnumbered Deming's men by three to one. Deming had also seen that the new jail guard who had taken over a 4 p.m. changeover, they were a bit more hostile to the prisoners than the previous guard was. With these puzzle pieces coming together, Deming now understood the reality of the situation, so he told young William Hamilton to go back up the courthouse tower to continue observation and immediately report to him any developments of this descending unidentified mob, which William Hamilton did. He's a good little kid. Now, once that order was issued... General Deming followed his orders from Governor Ford to retreat in the face of a superior force. Whatever would transpire upon the unknown force's arrival into Carthage was out of Deming's hands, and he had no way of stopping it. The one guy that Governor Ford counted on successfully guarding the jail was running from Carthage like it was already on fire. Franklin Worrell, a man in his uh, his late teens, was head of the new set of guards for the city jail that changed over at 4 p.m. Levi Williams, the leader of the unidentified mob, and Frank Worrell established communication. Levi Williams and his buddy Thomas Sharp coordinated this little ruse. Three shots fired in the air would signal to Frank Worrell the beginning of the assault by the mob from the outskirts of town. Now, Thomas Sharp, a good friend and neighbor of Levi Williams, as well as editor of the vociferously anti-Mormon paper, The Warsaw Signal, took a moment to rally the troops. Or maybe Thomas Sharp wasn't even in Carthage. He was in Warsaw at this point. The record isn't totally clear. A disputed account details Thomas Sharp's war cry to the men before they marched into Carthage. Quote, Friends and fellow citizens, the crisis has arrived when it becomes our duty to rise as free men and assert our rights. The law is insufficient for us. The governor will not enforce it. We must take it into our hands. We know what wrongs we suffer, and we are the best calculated to redress them. Now is the time to put a period to the mad career of the prophet, sustained as he is by a band of fanatical military saints. We have borne his usurpations until it would be cowardice to bear them longer. My fellow citizens, 
improve the opportunity that offers, lest the opportunity pass, and the despotic prophet will never again be in your power. All things are understood. We must hasten to Carthage and murder the smiths while the governor is absent at Nauvoo. Beard the lions in their den. The news will reach Nauvoo before the governor leaves. This will so enrage the Mormons that they will fall upon and murder Tom Ford, and we shall then be rid of the damned little governor and the Mormons too." answered by cheers from the crowd, end quote. So the clock ticked to 5 p.m., and a disputed account claims that Frank Worrell, the jail guard, began his watch at the 4 p.m. changeover, sent a message to Colonel Levi Williams, quote, Now is a delightful time to murder the Smiths. The governor has gone to Nauvoo with all the troops. The Carthage Greys are left to guard the prisoners. Five of our men will be stationed at the jail. The rest will be upon the public square. To keep up appearances, you will attack the men at the jail. A sham scuffle will ensue. Their guns will be loaded with blank cartridges. They will fire in the air. End quote. William Hamilton watched atop the city courthouse through his looking glass and saw, quote, a body of armed men, about 125, came out of the woods on foot and started in a single file behind an old rail fence in the direction of the jail. They were then about three-fourths of a mile distant, end quote. Following orders, young William Hamilton tried to report this development to Brigadier General Deming, but Deming was nowhere to be found. And this young William Hamilton wouldn't make it back to the jailhouse until after the shooting had already started. As this still unidentified mob descended on the jail, the Carthage Greys were stationed about a quarter mile west of the jailhouse. This happened unbeknownst to them. Frank Worrell and his boys were the Greys that were guarding the jail, but they were only like five to eight in number. The remainder of the Carthage Greys wouldn't join the fray until they saw Levi Williams' 125 men assaulting the jail. And almost everything that we're discussing today was already finished before any of the Carthage Greys even had time to get to the jail. These 125 men under the command of Levi Williams were mostly citizens of Warsaw, the twin anti-Mormon city to Carthage, which was 18 miles to its west. The men would be easily recognized in Carthage by any witnesses and therefore took measures to conceal their identity before emerging from the woods north of town. About a third of them blackened their faces with soot or painted their faces with red mud. If the assailants were lucky, the assault would be blamed on freed slaves or displaced Native Americans. Three shots were fired into the air, signaling the beginning of the plan. Levi's men marched toward the jail. Colonel Williams shouted, Rush in! There's no danger, boys! All is right! Quote, The jail where the Smiths were confined is situated at the extreme northwestern edge of the dismal village at the end of a long, ill-kept street whose middle is a dusty road and whose sides are gay with stramonium and dog fennel. As the Avengers came in sight of the mean-looking building that held their prey... The sleeping tiger that lurks in every human heart sprang up in theirs, and they quickened their pace to a run. There was no need of orders, no possibility of checking them now. End quote. Frank Worrell and his seven compatriots guarding the jail feigned a defense according to plan with Levi Williams. The jailer, George Steagle, was, was in the upper apartment with the prisoners, and when he heard a little rustling at the door, he ran down the stairs to the entrance to see what the commotion was about. There were gunshots out there. Of course he did. Levi's men were already descending on the jail, and they cried out for the guards to surrender. Frank Worrell and his boys fired their guns at the attackers, but the guns were loaded with blank cartridges. They, they'd do no more than leave a powder burn mark on clothing. Frank Worrell, who was 19 at this time, supposedly continued to struggle against the attackers, presumably to make it more believable that he was trying to actually defend the jail. Uh, But he also had a stutter, and an eyewitness account could be interpreted to conclude that Worrell wasn't a conspirator in the act, but plenty of other evidence seems to betray that conclusion. Quote, Frank Worrell floundered and pounded, vociferating, You lie still, you fool. We're not going to hurt you. Continued Frank kicking and struggling to break loose and trying frantically to break the third commandment, though his impediment of speech saved him from the actual sin. End quote. 
The jailer, George Stiegel, quickly understood what was going on with the gunshots. The mob outside his jail were too large, and he knew that he could do nothing as the jailer for the prisoners. He either cowered in a corner or he fled out the other exit of the jail because George Stiegel can't be placed for the next five minutes of history. But Frank Worrell did his job, as agreed with Levi Williams, and he fired the blank rounds over their heads, and he was pushed to the side of the doorway. And it was claimed later that he held the door open for the mob to flow into the jail unhindered, but I'm pretty sure a mob of guys, even you know, running inside with their guns, can hold their own door without Frank Worrell's help. Now, with so much commotion outside, Willard Richards glanced an eye by the curtain, saw a 100 armed men around the door. Now, Willard Richards told the prisoners what he saw, and the reality sank in for Richards, for John Taylor, and for Hiram and Joseph Smith. Now, we can't possibly imagine what went through their minds. Maybe, I'm about to die. This is the end of the line. I won't ever see my family or my wives ever again. None of us know what we'll think about when our lives are flashing before our eyes, but this was that moment for these four men. The jail itself is a pretty interesting building, and we need a brief description to kind of, you know, visualize in our mind's eye the events of the next few minutes. The building standing today is the same building that was built in 1839 and housed the prisoners. It's not a recreation like most Mormon history sites. It was purchased by the Mormon Church in 1903, and it was restored in the late 1990s to become a tourist location staffed by missionaries who tell the Carthage story to tens of visitors every year. I've been twice, and you know I can see the building in my mind's eye better than I can my own childhood at home. It's an experience you don't forget. The building itself is relatively small. You walk in through the kitchen area on the north side of the building, after which you enter the main living area. This is where the jailer, George Stiegel, lived. Then you turn to the right, and you see the landing area with a staircase. Now, to the right of this landing area, down the corridor, is a jail cell with an iron bar door and barred windows. But this is on the ground floor. Walk down that short corridor, and you come to another entrance to the building and the staircase. The staircase is very narrow, barely wide enough to fit two people if they, you know, scrunched their shoulders together. At the top of the stairs is a small doorway, which leads into the upper story jail cells. Now this, this it has a wooden door with an iron bar door behind it. So when you walk into that room, there are individual holding cells with more iron bars and metal locks. And, you know, the wooden and iron bar door also have locks on them. The windows in this dungeon, as it's known, are very narrow to the point that maybe a letter could be passed through the slit, but no person or even a cat could fit through the jail windows. The missionaries call this the dungeon. If you've ever been there, you know what I'm talking about. Now, these are the secure holding cells that the prisoners planned on going into once they had eaten their supper that evening, but they never got the opportunity. Had they been in that room, the mob would have not been able to get line of sight to shoot any of the prisoners unless they somehow broke through the two doors or the jailer gave them the key to get in, which doesn't really seem like something that George Stiegel would have done. He seems like a generally good guy. Now, once you're at the top of the stairs and, you know, you're looking at this dungeon door right in front of you, you turn to your right all around and in the hallway extends to a window on the other side of the stairway rail. But immediately in front of you is a wooden door with a broken latch, which opens into the room ahead. When you walk through that door, you enter a room that's about 15 feet by 15 feet with white plaster walls and it's a very small hearth and fireplace. A window, of course, sits on the far wall, and a two window sit on the south wall. There's also a bed against the southwest wall that was actually on the southeast wall at the time of the Carthage Jail assassinations. Now, today, there are benches in this room for people to sit during the missionary tour of the jail. But, of course, back then, there was probably just, you know, maybe a desk and a chair in an otherwise open space of the room. That's the general layout of the jail itself, and it remains in that basic form today for tourists to learn the Carthage jail story from Mormon missionaries. So, yay. However, and this is important, those missionaries leave out a few details. 
And they only talk about those details if you ask the questions directly. Questions like, did Joseph Smith have wine and tobacco, or did he have a pistol that he shot that day? They know the facts, but they only divulge those facts if you ask them directly. It's not part of the, the correlated narrative. It's, it's lying by omission for the Lord, I suppose. So Levi Williams's men pushed through Frank Worrell's feigned guard into the ground floor of the jail, shoving the jailer, George Stiegel, out of the picture. And they rounded the staircase and ran up the stairs. Now, it seems like the men weren't exactly sure where the prisoners were, and they ascended the stairs and they fired, quote, a shower of musket balls thrown up the stairway against the door of the prison in the second story, end quote. The number of shots at this dungeon door is unknown, but it was probably less than a dozen before the men realized the prisoners weren't in the jail cells of that room and were instead in the debtor's apartment to their right. Levi's men continued to clamor up the steps and fill the hallway above the staircase, facing the door to the room that was holding the prisoners, and these men began trying to push their way through the door. The time dilation becomes a reality that we must deal with here. All of the events described, from Frank Worrell's feigned defense of the jail to the men rushing up the stairs, would have transpired in less than 30 seconds. In fact, everything that we'll spend most of today's episode on today took place in the space of about six minutes. It was a chaotic time with hundreds of individual actors and only one resolution to the sequence of events. We'll spend 12 times the amount of time talking about the events as I took for them to actually transpire. As these men were rushing up the steps and firing into the jail cell door at the top of the stairs, the, the prisoners, Joe, Hiram, sidekick of Smith, John Taylor, and Whiteout Willard Richards all understood that this was their final stand, and they quickly braced themselves against the door. That wooden plank door was literally the only thing between them and a mob of 60 to 70 men who had rushed into the jail to shoot the prisoners like rats in a cage that they were. That door was the final bulwark protecting their lives, and they knew it. But the attacking men also knew it. This is an unstoppable force meeting an immovable object. The attackers tried to push on the door, but Willard Richards and John Taylor immediately braced themselves against the door. Joe and Hiram both grabbed their pistols, Hiram with his single shooter and Joe with his six shooter pepper box pistol. And all four men braced against the door to try and keep the men from pushing in. Hiram was the closest to the latch while Willard Richards was the closest to the hinges of the door by the northwest corner of the room. As the mob filled the upper story and the stairwell of Carthage Jail, the prisoners continued to push hard against the mob's advances. The mob, however, thought that the locking mechanism on the door was what was holding it shut, not the four men on the other side of the door. And a shot blew through the metal latch on the door, shattering the workings of an already broken door latching mechanism. When a hot lead ball shot from a pistol collides with cold steel of a door latch, the bullet does anything but act predictably. And it broke through the latching mechanism, but it didn't seem to emerge on the other side of the door with any lethal effect. What it did was scare the prisoners because they now understood that the attackers were willing to use gunshots to get through the door against which those four men were braced. By the time the prisoners realized this, it was too late. Hiram pulled his single-shot pistol out of his pocket and attempted to shoot it back through the door at the assailants. And whether or not this shot hit true or it simply embedded into the door or what actually happened with Hiram Smith's pistol shot here it's actually unknown but after firing Hiram probably dropped the single shot pistol and then braced himself against the door but it didn't much matter because as soon as he pushed his weight against the door a second ball blasted through the door a few inches above the door latch this proved to be an infamous and effective shot with four men bracing one door Bullets smashing through that door were bound to hit somebody. 
Now, when you picture somebody bracing themselves against a door to keep people out or in, you can see how they're postured against it, right? You know, one shoulder is lower with, you know, the full shoulder and arm contact on the door. One foot is hard against the floor and the door jam. One leg is extended far behind them to provide, you know, a triangle figure with the floor for the best structural support. And then the other hand is probably above their head, pushing against the door as well for added support. This is the posture that Hiram Smith was in while yelling to his younger brother to hold the door or shoot at the men through it or do something to help. This second shot that pierced through the door above the latch stuck true. Hiram's head was pressed against the door, was very, very close to it, looking downward slightly at the floor while he was using every bit of his strength, pushing against the wooden plank. This ball hit him in the face on the left of his nose, traveling through his skull and exiting below his jawbone, possibly entering his neck again before passing out the other side of it. Now, this bullet could have severed his brainstem, which would have caused him to go instantly limp. And I want to use this as a jump off point to talk about this whole Carthage jail incident in the abstract for a few minutes. This isn't to be overly morbid. This digression is merely to discuss the deep and sinister reality of what happened that fateful day. Besides, nothing that I'm about to describe is any more disturbing than what you see on primetime TV. Uh, Still, listeners, beware and abandon all hope, ye who enter here. As humans, we have a lot of traditions, rituals, holy days, languages, family dynamics, ways to look at the complexities of the world. All these traditions evolve from older traditions, and sometimes we get better at them in some way as those practices evolve. However, One of the oldest human traditions, older than language, older than religion, older than using fire to cook our food, older than any system of thought, is killing one another. Us humans, we are spectacularly good at killing each other. We're so good at killing each other that we got bored with rocks and sticks, so we attached rocks to sticks and then broke the rocks to make them sharper and thereby more effective at the job of killing. When that wasn't enough, we put rocks on sticks and learned how to shoot them at each other from a distance. Then we found out that some rocks are better than other rocks. Then we wanted to make rocks shaped in certain ways so the entire stick can be a rock. So then we heated up the rocks and turned them into big metal sticks with sharp edges. During all of this, we also figured out that some plants can kill each other. We figured out we can burn each other and we can pour burning oils on each other and plenty of morbid and lethal ways to get rid of one another. Beyond that, however, we also figured out all sorts of unique and novel ways to hurt each other without actually killing each other, which is just a fascinating phenomenon in and of itself. I I doubt any other species of animal engages in torture the way that us humans do to specifically cause harm without quite killing the victim. A a, a remarkable practice, and that distinguishes us below any other animals in the the animal kingdom. Now, millions of years have passed, and we've never stopped innovating on murdering each other. Now, in the last 1,000 years, the technology of death has seen a figurative and a literal explosion in the form of chemical reactions. Fire is super deadly, but what if we could throw that fire 100 meters through the air at our enemies? What if we put fire in a little metal ball that exploded and sent the metal and fire flying in all directions? Gunpowder alone has done more to advance the technology of murder than arguably any other human invention. A little bit of potassium nitrate, some charcoal and sulfur, and all sorts of fun inventions can center around this very simple chemical reaction, which is stable until heat is added. Over a thousand years ago, a Chinese inventor used gunpowder to shoot spears from a bamboo tube. When bamboo became too fragile for larger explosions, metal tubes were forged, and the gun was invented a few hundred years later. It wasn't long before this incredible invention spread across the planet and became a mainstay of well-funded militias who could absolutely dominate other forces who didn't have the innovation known as the gun. The tactical advantage afforded by a gun is incredible. Why get up close and personal with swords or spears or something like that? That guy might kill me. Instead, I'll shoot him from a distance where he can't possibly kill me with his sword or spear. 
Then I'm going to reload and kill all of his friends while never in real danger myself. Like, if there are enough of these guys, you can take them all out with one big gun if it's big enough. A big enough explosion and you can eventually turn entire civilizations into glass surrounded by uninhabitable radioactive waste. <laughs> modern problems require modern solutions and civilization... <sighs> well, look how far we've come. You know, as all of this murder innovation was rapidly expanding, technologies for exploring and colonizing unknown lands was also aggressively accelerating. Transoceanic trade and circumnavigation transitioned from a rarity by explorers to an everyday occurrence by traders and settlers. These people traversed oceans in the matter of weeks or months, carrying guns and cannons. They became the superior force to which the rest of the world was forced to bow. Then some gun-toting miscreants here in North America told the vastly superior British Empire to get off their lawn and won a war to declare their will the final word that would carry this specific landmass into the next few centuries. Now, those same people kicked off a multi-generational campaign of colonization so brutal that it resulted in the near-complete eradication of most of the people who are already living here. Thousands of cultures and languages, millions died by guns, germs, and steel when their own innovations of murder simply couldn't keep pace. There's simply no denying the power of the gun in all of this. The oldest human tradition of killing one another is never more simple and effective than the gun. A human with unnecessary holes in them doesn't live for very long. The entire science of ballistics transitioned from calculating the distance and accuracy of trebuchets and catapults to figuring out how a gun can best be designed to make a bullet go exactly where the shooter wants. Rifled barrels, cartridge rounds, repeating actions, machine guns, larger calibers and heavier power loads than vehicles to carry these guns, artillery that fire rounds over miles instead of yards, bombs dropped from the air or fired from underwater... Each of these innovations increase the murdering power of the humans wielding these portable death machines. And today, you can buy a portable death machine for less than an average grocery store run, and there's something like three of those machines for every citizen of this country. It's a baffling world to me. Now, when a bullet makes contact with human flesh, some truly incredible things happen. And this is, this is the science of terminal ballistics, and this isn't gratuitous, this is foundational information to bring into focus the reality of what we're discussing today. When a bullet hits flesh, it does some really crazy stuff. The bullet is carrying a ton of kinetic energy. With relatively little mass accelerated with so much energy, these hot pieces of lead travel extremely quickly, with many modern bullets breaking the speed of sound, which is over 750 miles an hour, 343 meters per second. If designed correctly, all that kinetic energy transfers to human flesh upon impact. Now, the primary cavity is where the bullet enters the flesh, and it's usually the size of the bullet caliber. That's the bullet hole that you see on a person's skin, but that's only where the carnage begins. The majority of the bullet's energy is transferred as soon as it punctures through the flesh. The temporary cavity created immediately after entering the skin can expand the tissue up to 40 times the size of a bullet. Now, most bullets are less than half an inch in diameter, but the cavity that it creates can become twice the size of a baseball. Now, tissue is mostly liquid. It doesn't compress, meaning all of that tissue expands into the surrounding flesh. And it does that by compressing organs and ripping and tearing the tissue and causing incredible amounts of chaos and damage as that bullet transfers its energy by creating that temporary cavity that's massive. Now, as the flesh absorbs all that energy, it creates what's known as an impact crater, where the flesh is destroyed behind the initial impact cavity. Now, once that energy is absorbed, the flesh will attempt to return to its prior form to, you know, prior to the bullet entering that flesh. And the rebounding of the flesh to try and seal up this temporary cavity can be nearly as destructive as the bullet itself creating the cavity. And of course, different bullets act different ways. And in the case of today's subject matter, they're all spherical lead balls that can do all sorts of crazy stuff. Uh, full metal jacket bullets used by militaries across the globe, they're designed to pass straight through bodies and leave very little tissue damage, but to incapacitate the victim. 
hollow points that, you know, police officers use. They're designed to stop inside the victim. This is the stopping power of the bullet. When a hollow point hits the target, it immediately expands into a mushroom-like form, transferring all of its energy immediately and stopping somewhere inside the person's body, which adds to the stopping power and also ensures the safety of anybody who may be standing or sitting or whatever behind the victim. Now, if you're the victim of a gunshot, the best possible outcome is for the bullet to pass straight through because some of its energy isn't transferred to the flesh. Much worse scenarios, however, result when the bullet is able to transfer all of the energy, and it can do that in a few ways. If the chunk of flesh is thick enough, you know, center mass of a target, a person's torso, the person's organs are going to absorb all of the energy and the bullet is going to remain inside their body. But much worse things can happen when bones get involved. Bones can handle a lot of stress and torque, but high velocity, low mass impact is not what bones evolved to withstand. When the bullet strikes a bone, the transfer of energy to the bone will often cause it to just disintegrate, shooting bone fragments into the surrounding tissue, causing even more damage. Basically, a bullet striking a bone can turn that bone into a grenade inside of the victim's body. This will also cause the bullet to ricochet to other parts of the body. It, it's chaos. And when uh, when a bullet is fired into a skull, um, that, that presents a, a whole new set of circumstances. A bullet can enter the brain and then you know pass out the back of the skull, or it can ricochet off of the back of the skull and travel the opposite direction back through the brain, causing even more damage as it continues to expend all of its energy and then lodge somewhere else in the person's head. And bullets can also tumble after entering a body, which causes irregular and multidirectional permanent cavities. And of course, the permanent cavity is what's left behind from the path of the bullet itself. Now, once that initial cavity is opened up and, you know, immediately after the impact and then the tissue closes around that huge temporary cavity that was expanded, there's still the path of the actual bullet, which forms a channel of ripped and destroyed tissue. Now, if you've ever seen videos of ballistics gel or, or some episodes of Mythbusters, you know how everything that I just described looks. It's some horrifying stuff to think about, and it's a pretty accurate representation of human flesh being shot. Now, this is all part of the terminal ballistics. That's the nitty gritty of how bullets interact with flesh. But when a human is shot... There's a whole set of other factors to consider, because rarely is it immediately fatal. We've all seen action movies where the hero wastes entire armies of bad guys with a single bullet to each enemy as they blast through the baddie lair, and then they're captured by the ultimate baddie who gives a long, belabored speech before the hero is rescued by the sidekick. hi Unexpected variable. That's fun, but it's not how humans actually act when they're shot. A bullet to the head or through the heart are about the only way to cause a person to go immediately limp or unconscious. Even then, they'll often survive for a few minutes, even if they're immobilized. For an absolutely instantaneous death, you have to sever the brainstem. Now, prisoners of death camps, political dissidents, and gulags, they'll often catch a bullet to the back of the head. And that's because when the bullet is fired, right at the base of the skull, the brainstem is destroyed. And there's basically no suffering, no noise, no protestation, nothing. Just lights out, that's the end of it. Anything other than the brainstem severance, the person's going to live for a certain amount of time before bleeding out or before organ failure. Center mass shots, hits to the torso, they're often going to leave a person alive for minutes or hours before death. Or if the bleeding is stopped, they can recover slowly, often dying to complications of the shot sometime later, days, weeks, months, years. And I also want to note that hitting nerve centers or tendons can cause immediate loss of control. A person shot in the leg or the arm is going to have instant nerve damage and they're often unable to use the muscles that are damaged by the shot, sometimes never again. A shot or, let's say, seven shots to the back is exceptionally dangerous because the fragmentation of a bullet hitting bone coupled with the nervous system running through the spine, it's inevitably going to cause loss of control, loss of feeling, and usually paralysis to some extent if the person survives. Now, 
I've only seen a few movies which accurately depict gunshot wounds. And the one that comes to mind is Public Enemies, the, the Johnny Depp and Christian Bale movie about the Great Depression era bank robbers. It stuns me how accurate that movie portrays people being shot. And it's also an oddly apt movie to bring into today's episode. So this second shot through the apartment door that hit Hiram in the face did the fatal damage necessary to render him useless to the other three men in the room. Legend says that Hiram yelled, I am a dead man as he fell backwards. But if his brainstem was actually sh severed, uh, which the evidence indicates that that likely happened, he wouldn't have spoken a word. He would have just gone limp. While the muscles of his body, you know, pushed him away from the door in reaction and he fell backwards. And then he would have hit his head on the hardwood floor as his body just slumped lifelessly. There's, there's nothing. Lights out. If the brainstem wasn't severed, Hiram Smith's, the, the wound to his neck would cause him to bleed out within a matter of minutes while he remained largely conscious of what happened around him, unable to speak or to cry out for help as his lungs and esophagus filled with his own blood and his life drained out. He would have watched everything that we're about to discuss, powerless to change the situation, and I tend to believe that his brainstem was severed and that he had, you know, two large holes in his neck for reasons that we're going to discuss in a little bit here. When Hiram collapsed on the floor, the other prisoners, fueled by pure adrenaline, they understood they were next. Before he was chased out of Carthage jail earlier that day, Stephen Markham, you know, loyalist to Joe, piggy bank Steve, he had left his cane in the room called a rascal beater because of the textured knob at the top of the cane. Stephen Markham left his rascal beater in the jail. Now, Stephen Markham, Piggy Bank Steve, had expected to return to the jail that day, and he didn't mean to leave his cane in the jail cell, but the Carthage Grays had other plans for him, uh, and they chased him out of town. However, his rascal beater did provide John Taylor and Willard Richards with a second cane to use as a weapon. As the mob clambered up the stairs, Taylor and Richards armed themselves with Markham's rascal beater and another cane that was in the room. And these canes would prove invaluable in preserving their lives. Seeing his brother fall and blood beginning to pool underneath Hiram, Joe pulled his six-shooter Allen and Thurber pepper box pistol from his pocket. Without Hiram helping to keep the door pushed closed, Richards and Taylor began to struggle under the force of the mob trying to push the door open. And it nudged open slightly, but just a few inches, and the attackers began to push the barrels of their state-issued rifles through the door into the room and started shooting. Now, Taylor and Richards at this point used their canes to hit the barrels of the guns sticking through the door. Joe saw an opportunity, and he shoved the muzzle of his pepper box pistol through the small opening, squeezing the trigger as fast as his finger could pull it. This situation is the exact intent for the design of a pepper box pistol. They're useless at hitting a target even on the other side of a room, but when fired point-blank range into a crowd of people, every ball is going to strike flesh. However, pepper box pistols are also notoriously unreliable, even if you're able to keep the powder dry. Of the six charged barrels, only three actually fired, and some traditions say four of the six barrels actually fired. We can be certain of three. John Hay, a, an eyewitness account, uh, counts four and even details how each bullet st struck true on each victim. Quote, he shot an Irish man named Wills, who was in the affair from his congenital love of a brawl in the arm. Gallagher, a southerner from the Mississippi bottom in the face. That's a Missourian. Voorhees, a half-grown hobbledehoy from Bear Creek in the shoulder. And another gentleman whose name I will not mention as he is prepared to prove an alibi and besides stand six feet two in his moccasins. End quote. Now, none of these shots from Joe's pepper box pistol were fatal, even Gallagher, who was shot in the face. And to be clear, Joe was trying to hold the door from being pushed further open, and then he just stuck his arm around the side of the door into the opening when he fired. He didn't have time to take aim at anybody specifically or square up a headshot. He was just 
shooting a smooth bore pepper box pistol into a mass of dozens of men. He was bound to hit every shot because he's you know, not a stormtrooper. Now, Richards and Taylor later claimed that two of these men died from being shot by Joe, but there's absolutely no evidence to substantiate that claim, and those two men simply wouldn't have any way of knowing that you know two men died from being shot. Now, once these three or four shots were fired from Joe's smuggled pistol uh, by Cyrus Wheelock, the men at the door briefly recoiled. Now, they would have been struck with this dumb, you know, having second thoughts because... The prisoners weren't supposed to be armed. They were in jail. But they were just shot at by one of the prisoners. But what if all of them had pistols? They also wouldn't have known that the bullet that ripped through the door had just killed Hiram. So the mob on the other side of the door probably considered these shots from Joseph Smith to be aggression, not retaliation. What started as an attempt to assassinate two men now became a gunfight. And the attackers didn't know if another mistake might lead to more of them getting shot. So they needed to make quick work of this matter. Outside the jail, the Carthage Greys were responding to all of the commotion from their encampment about a quarter mile away from the jail. The report of gunfire coming from the jail could mean only a few things. Either the Mormons are trying to break the prophet out of jail or another militia was there to kill the prophet. Either way, they were needed and the roughly 60 Carthage Greys who remained by special appointment from Governor Ford under the command of Robert F. Smith, no relation to Joseph Smith, began to run with their rifles towards the jail. And it's possible that some of them were aware of this whole plan by Levi Williams and Frank Worrell to storm the jail and the feigned, you know, blank shots and everything. But it's most likely that almost all of these men had no idea what kind of situation they would encounter once reaching the jail. Now, a quarter mile can be covered by an armed soldier in the space of about two and a half to three minutes at full adrenaline-fueled sprint. Back at the jail, the attackers redoubled their onslaught after taking these shots from the Prophet. They pushed even harder on the door, and when Hiram, (laughs) dead, he wasn't able to help hold the door, John Taylor and Joseph Smith realized that they were outnumbered, they were outgunned, and they didn't have any way to prevent the continued attack. They tried as best they could to hold the door while Willard Richards and John Taylor continued to try and hold the door closed with one arm while hitting the gun barrel sticking through the door with their rascal beater canes, one of which was Stephen Markham's. But inevitably, the mob gained the upper hand and they pushed even harder on the door. This, This door opens into the apartment. When it's fully opened, it creates a space in the corner of the room which covers anything that's in that space. Now, another shot rang through the door, and it grazed Willard Richards on the ear. And as all of these gunshots were going off, and Levi's men were in the courtyard surrounding the jail, and they heard all the gunshots inside, the men from the courtyard began firing their rifles into the windows from outside. Now, none of these men in the courtyard could get a line of sight to fire on anybody in the room, so their bullets just smashed through the windows and then embedded in the ceiling above the windows. Now, these are all single-shot military-issue rifles, and undoubtedly some of the soldiers carried their own pistols as secondary weapons, but the quartermaster of state militias usually didn't issue pistols uh, of any sort to soldiers like this. They were armed with state-issued rifles and with swords any other guns that they privately owned they were brought of their own volition for this special task now each of these rifles required reloading before they could be fired again a skilled soldier could get off three rounds per minute which means about 15 to 20 seconds to reload a rifle with powder with ball with wad and then tamp it down now cartridge rifles and repeating rifles they actually wouldn't be widely used until a few decades later in the civil war as those inventions they were just a little bit too young to be widely circulated by the mid-1840s. What all of this means is the assailants probably fired in volleys. A salvo of rifle shots would go off, and then there'd be a short delay before the soldiers were ready to fire again. Those at the front of the mob could, however, increase their fire rate if they were handed loaded guns from other assailants that were further back in the crowd. Now, to what extent reloading versus passing already loaded guns and, you know, so that the men in the back of the mob were just the reloaders, to what extent all of this kind of took place in this specific instance, we can never know. We do know, however, that the men in the hallway began pushing into the jail cell while the men in the courtyard 
fired rounds into the window, partially in hopes that maybe a, a bullet might get lucky or maybe it'll ricochet and strike one of the victims, but more so to just dissuade any attempt to jump out the window to escape. Now, Joe yelled to the other two surviving men, that's right, brother Taylor, parry them off as well as you can. While Willard Richards and John Taylor continued using their canes to just whack the rifle barrels and deflect the rifles that were sneaking further and further into the room. And Taylor remembered this, quote, It certainly was far from pleasant to be so near the muzzles of those firearms as they belched forth their liquid flames and deadly balls, end quote. And as more rifle muzzles were pushed through the small opening of the door, more men continued to push up the narrow stairway and against the door. Three men holding the door, they can only withstand so much of this pressure before the mob outside gains the advantage. Hiram's corpse bleeding out was certainly a morale crusher as well, a harbinger of each one of their coming deaths. Joe and John Taylor realized the futility, and they peeled away from the door simultaneously, and they made a run for the window, leaving Willard Richards to be pinned behind the door in the corner of the room as their mob pushed their way in. At this point, the two running men, the door was open. They became completely exposed to gunfire while Hiram just, you know, bled out at the feet of the assailants. While running, John Taylor was the first to be struck. As he ran, this first bullet hit John Taylor's leg. Now, this ball entered into the back of his upper thigh glanced off of his bone, which flattened the ball, and it continued its deflected path, lodging in the front of his leg about a half inch underneath the skin. While Taylor was lucky with this shot, as it didn't directly hit his leg bone and cause the bone to disintegrate, the ball lodged barely underneath the skin at the front of his thigh, meaning that it was able to transfer all of its kinetic energy into his flesh. It immediately severed nerves, and Taylor fell forward on his way to the window. He, quote, lost entirely and instantaneously all power of action or locomotion, end quote. And he fell into the windowsill in kind of like a falling and kneeling type of position. His torso collided with the edge of the windowsill, which broke his pocket watch with the hands at precisely 5, 16, and 21 seconds p.m., freezing in time the infamous moment when this gunfight occurred. He yelled out, I am shot! And as Taylor stumbled into the windowsill, he briefly thought, we might have some friends outside and that there might be some chance of escape. But what he saw out the window was about a hundred men with their guns pointed at the window, which now framed his face looking down at his assailants. In a situation like this, people don't have time to think, they just act. When Taylor saw a hundred guys out the window with rifles pointed at him, he pushed himself back from the windowsill and they fired another volley of bullets into the ceiling above his head. Taylor later attributed this physical movement to divine intervention. It's not like he had time to run the calculations in his mind that there were probably less men in the room than there were out in the courtyard, thus you know, increasing his chances of survival if he stayed in the room instead of dove out the second story window. He just acted based on the greatest threat that was in front of his face, which was a hundred guys, you know, aiming their rifles at him. So he pushed himself back from the window, unknowingly securing his survival. And then he slumped down onto the ground, then realized that the men were pushing into the room from the doorway. Taylor was unable to stand, but he could roll, which he did, to the only place where there was any cover, under the bed in the southeast corner of the room by the window. As he tried to roll, he entirely was exposed to the men pushing into the room, and they continued to fire on him. He was prone with his feet toward the men that were pushing into the room, which explains the nature of the rest of the wounds. The second shot that he took hit him in the left knee, which traveled up his thigh and then embedded near his groin. And he claimed in 1854 that this bullet was never extracted. He then, you know, he was covering his 
his head with his arms, kind of like a boxer does. And he tried to roll. And then the third bullet entered his left arm near the elbow. Now, this third bullet ripped through muscle and tendon all the way traveling up his arm and then crushed through his wrist joint and came to a halt a little above the upper joint of my little finger. Had his arms not been up protecting his head and taking this bullet, this third bullet likely would have struck his torso or his head. And I think most people would take a bullet ripping through their arm instead of their organs or their skull any day of the week. The fourth and final bullet that hit John Taylor is the most gruesome. His left flank is what took all of these shots, his left leg, his left arm. And that means that he was, you know, nearly under the bed as all three of these bullets basically hit him simultaneously. This fourth ball entered the flesh of his left hand. Now, while this is the nastiest wound of them all, it was also the least damaging. This ball essentially grazed his hip, but the ball passed straight through, meaning that it didn't transfer all of its energy into his body. Now, the temporary cavity that a bullet creates, it can expand the flesh up to 40 times the diameter of the bullet. So when this ball entered his hip, that expansion basically caused his hip flesh to explode where that temporary cavity was made, which exposed bone and flesh, and it caused a massive amount of bleeding. According to Taylor, the bullet tore away the flesh as large as my hand dashing the mangled fragments of flesh and blood against the wall. Now, this this massive chunk of flesh missing meant that the ball, it didn't lodge in his body. It just carried the rest of its energy with the pieces of flesh and hip bone onto the wall above his head as he finished rolling under the bed. And this all happened in the space of two to three seconds. Now, as John Taylor absorbed these shots, the men pushing into the room probably thought, you know, they, they killed... Taylor, he saw the bone and blood splatter on the wall, but he wasn't their primary target. Their primary target was running to the same window that Taylor had fallen against before rolling under the bed. Joseph and Hiram Smith were the men that the militia were there to kill that day. Hiram was motionless on the floor and Joe was dashing for the window. The mob took aim at the fleeing Joseph and they fired. He immediately took one shot to center mass, and the bullet entered somewhere in his back above his right hip and lodged somewhere inside of his torso, which buckled him over, and it hampered his ability to keep running. And he got to the window, and he did the only thing that he could think of. He lifted both arms to the square at either side of his head and shouted, "'Oh, Lord, my God! Is there no help for the widow's son?' the Masonic distress call. Many of the men that were in this mob were Freemasons, as were most of the leading politicians like Governor Ford. Now, back earlier this morning, in the morning of June 27th, uh, Mormon loyalist Dan Jones told Governor Ford that Joe and Hiram were Master Masons, and they required his protection before Jones himself was chased out of Carthage that morning. Jones was invoking the distress of the Brotherhood in hopes that Governor Ford would take more seriously the threats to the lives of his fellow Master Masons. That was a Masonic threat. Joe did the same thing while he was dangling out of the window, and accounts differ as to what happened immediately after. Most accounts say that he was fatally shot and he fell lifeless out the window. Others say that he jumped from the window and then was executed. Yet another account that's disputed claims that... He was in the window for three to four minutes, essentially bargaining with the men in the courtyard while the men in the room continued to keep their guns aimed at him. They probably stopped because he made the Masonic cry for help. Now, here's the sequence of events that I I, I can best piece together. After taking that first bullet, Joe went to the window and he made that Masonic distress call. And there was a momentary pause in the shooting as this is a powerful invocation. The Masons in the mob knew that they were about to assassinate a fellow Master Mason. And the non-Masons in the crowd knew they were about to take the life of a Master Mason, which carried deadly consequences for them if they went through with this murder. The oaths of fealty sworn to by Masons, they're taken very seriously with throat slitting and everything, especially at this time in frontier America. 
This brief pause forced everybody to think for a minute, all while Joe was bleeding from this one gunshot wound to his back, possibly having some organ failure and, you know, beginning to see tunnel vision. Now, Levi Williams was in the crowd, surrounded by his men in the courtyard while they were looking up at the prophet sitting in the windowsill and, you know, probably crying out for mercy. Levi Williams yelled, shoot him! God damn him! Shoot the damn rascal! And the men inside the room responded appropriately. They fired again, and another bullet struck true in Joe's right side, causing him to recoil and then fall out of the window. This is a fall of two stories onto hard dirt. Joseph Smith fell head first, and he hit the ground with his left shoulder and his head making contact first, and then his feet slumping soon after behind him. This fall probably broke his neck and caused brain damage, but it wasn't actually fatal. The prophet lay face down in the dirt of the Carthage jail courtyard, struggling for consciousness, one or two bullets lodged in his body. And he tried to push himself up, but he was too crippled from the gunshots and the fall to be able to move himself. He was maybe even paralyzed from a broken neck. Now, Levi Williams or some unidentified kid dragged Joseph Smith, bleeding, dying in excruciating pain, a few feet across the dirt to the center of the courtyard where they propped him up, leaning against the bricks of a well. As he was being dragged through the dust, the men who chased him out of the window to begin with, they quickly evacuated the jail in order to go down to the courtyard and witness and participate in the lynching that they were all taking part in. The jail emptied of the men who had pushed through the door, and as they ran down the stairs into the courtyard, the 50 to 60 men of the Carthage Greys finally arrived after their quarter-mile sprint at the jail. And they were there to find out what the commotion was. Now, Levi Williams and some men, including Jacob Davis and William Grover, they gathered around the broken and dying Joseph Smith. And at this point, I can only assume that Joe was probably begging for his life. I mean, I doubt that at any time during the previous three to five minutes, he'd accepted his fate. Now, a group of men gathered around him, and at least two of them pointed their rifles at his chest pulled their triggers and murdered him by sending two to four more bullets smashing through his torso and vital organs. Quote, The fire was simultaneous. A slight cringe of the body was all the indication of pain that he betrayed when the balls struck him. He fell upon his face. End quote. And given all of his injuries from the past few minutes, this was an act of mercy. It's kind of poetic, isn't it? Joseph Smith started his magical journey by finding his famed brown seer stone while digging a well. He gave his most impactful and famed speech at the funeral of a man who died at digging a well. And a well was the last conscious sensation he felt pressing against his back as he was gunned down by these men. The upper apartment had been abandoned by the assailants, who immediately clambered down the stairs to witness this lynching firsthand. And as they emptied the room, Willard Richards pulled himself from the southwest corner, pushed the door back open, and it concealed him. And he ran to the window that Joe fell out of and looked at the scene below long enough to witness the men dragging Joe to the well for his execution. Richards assessed the situation, and he tried to find an escape, but no exit of the jail was unobserved by the enemies surrounding it. Richards would be unable to escape, even though he was unharmed except for a little scratch on the ear. He he saw the motionless body of Hiram with a puddle of blood underneath his head and his neck seeping through the floorboards to the kitchen below. He saw the splattered blood and bone fragments on the wall from John Taylor and probably assumed that he was dead as well. So Richards turned to leave the room in an attempt to find a hiding place somewhere, anywhere. But as he was about to step out of the door, he heard a weak cry from under the bed. Stop, doctor, and take me along. Whether this voice was reassuring to hear or distressing, we can't imagine what was going through the mind of Willard Richards, or the mind of the man who said the words for that matter. So Richards turned around and looked under the bed, and John Taylor 
was a mess. He was absolutely covered in blood. His left leg was bleeding profusely. His arm was unusable. The shattered bones of his left hip joint were completely exposed to open air. Taylor didn't see out the window what Richards had just witnessed, the execution of their supreme leader. Richards exclaimed to John Taylor, Oh, Brother Taylor, is it possible that they've killed both Brother Hiram and Joseph? It cannot surely be, and yet I saw them shoot them. Richards, he he was an absolute wreck, and he apparently said a little prayer, quote, elevating his hands two or three times, saying, O Lord my God, spare thy servants, end quote. Willard Richards was a Thompsonian herbal physician, not a surgeon. He had never seen this level of carnage and pain his entire life, but he did what he could with what he had. John Taylor wasn't in control of himself. He was probably in shock at this time with that characteristic thousand-yard stare, so it was all on Willard Richards to get both men to safety. Now, Richards took an extreme risk in helping John Taylor. He said, Brother Taylor, this is a terrible event, while he was pulling Taylor from underneath the bed. And Withered Richards, he was a big guy, over 300 pounds, while Taylor was a pretty small and slender guy. Richards picked up John Taylor and brought him into the adjacent room with the jail cells, the dungeon. And Richards put Taylor in one of the cells and then filled the wound on his hip with straw while saying, I'm sorry, I cannot do better for you. After which, Willard Richards grabbed a dirty old straw mattress and put it on top of John Taylor to hopefully conceal him from anybody entering the jail cells looking for the rest of the Mormons. Richards, at this time, as he was covering him with this old straw mattress, told John Taylor, That may hide you and you may yet live to tell the tale, but I expect they'll kill me in a few moments. And Taylor recounts, while laying in this position, I suffered the most excruciating pain. After concealing John Taylor, Willard Richards ran back into the apartment and looked out the window again to see if there were any signs of life, regardless of my own, determined to see the end of him that I loved. There was no sign of life. Joseph Smith was a corpse. Richards understood the reality of the situation, and he resigned himself to his likely fate of a similar execution in an unknown amount of time in the future. Minutes, seconds, he didn't know. So he returned to the jail cell where he had concealed John Taylor and awaited the arrival of the mob back up the stairs. Joe was dead, and the mob knew that Hiram had been hit, but they weren't sure that he was dead as well. So they all ran back up the stairs, surely causing Willard Richards to go into a panic. And they found Hiram lying motionless on the floor with a bullet in his face and an exit wound on the back of his neck. Now, there was a pool of blood under his head and his right shoulder also had a considerable amount of blood. The men ran into the room and they shot him three more times to ensure that he was actually dead. These bullets entered his back, entered an arm, and they entered a leg and his torso to the left of his navel. The shot which entered his back passed completely through his body and it smashed his pocket watch, completely destroying it. Now what is curious about these shots is Hiram didn't seem to bleed out of them at all. The shot which passed through his skull, out his jaw, and into and out of his neck It left a massive bloodstain on his shirt that day and on the floor, so much so that somebody actually cut a large chunk of the fabric out of his shirt, possibly because it was just so gruesome or possibly out of a sense of, like, I don't know, preserving the material which had the most amount of blood and flesh material on it. I I don't know. They, They cut a triangle out of his shirt. However, all these other holes in his clothes... They don't contain any bloodstains, nor any evidence that blood was ever washed from those areas. This can really only mean that Hiram had completely bled out from his head and neck wound before these extra shots, which would mean that Hiram was dead for a few minutes before the men returned to the upper room and put these other bullets in him. This means that Joe was in the windowsill in the courtyard for as long as like five to seven minutes before he was executed. 
and the mob returned to Hiram to make sure that he was dead. After these gratuitous bullets ripped through Hiram's corpse, a cry was heard from outside from an unknown person. The Mormons are coming! And the men immediately flew down the stairs and then they scattered in all directions from Carthage jail. Maybe it was Willard Richards who yelled it from the other room. In the space of about five to seven minutes, from Frank Worrell shooting his blank rounds at Levi's men to all of those men fleeing in all directions from the jail out of fear of the Nauvoo Legion, the deed was done. Now, a disputed account claims that a young man who was supposedly the son of Lilburn Boggs or something attempted to decapitate Joseph Smith, but a pillar of light scared him and everybody else off. But the account is full of plenty of other details, way too ridiculous to believe. And those details, that account actually served to hinder the prosecution against the assailants the following year. That same account claims that Willard Richards stood in the middle of the room and blocked the bullets with a magic wand like a Jedi. It's a pretty humorous version of events. Now, Joe's body lay a broken shell with multiple bullet holes, possibly broken bones, including his neck, and he was slumped against the well in the courtyard at the jail. John Taylor's wounds were beginning to coagulate as he lay in excruciating pain in and out of consciousness under this dirty old straw mattress. Willard Richards waited in the jail near the dying John Taylor. I expected to be shot the next moment and stood before the door awaiting the onset. But the men never came. The Nauvoo Legion never came. Brigadier General, who was personally appointed by Governor Ford to guard the jail, never came. Levi Williams, who put this bloodbath into motion, never came. Dan Jones, Stephen Markin, John Fulmer, Cyrus Wheelock, any more loyalists, they never came. Willard Richards was all alone in that building, with two dead friends and a third on his way, in and out of consciousness. All told, 35 bullets were found lodged in the plaster of the walls and the ceiling of the room. Joe had at least four bullets in him. Hiram had at least four bullets in him. A fifth if he used his single shot pistol on himself, which is entirely possible. John Taylor had four bullets in him. A gun went off in the kitchen as the men were pushing past George Stiegel, the jailer. Joe fired three or four rounds from his pepper box pistol that was smuggled in by Cyrus Wheelock. Hiram discharged his bullet from a single shot pistol that was smuggled in by John S. Fulmer. Uh, an unknown number of bullets were fired up the stairway toward the jail door before the assailants realized that the men were in the apartment instead of the jail. Frank Worrell and his boys, in their feigned defense of the jail, fired four blank rounds at Levi Williams' attackers. And then an unknown number of balls bounced off of the stone of the outside building, just leaving, you know, kind of small dents. Best estimates place the number of shots fired in that short period of time between 75 and 100 rounds, although those estimates are understandably squishy. As the mob fled Carthage jail, the citizens of Carthage only heard the report of gunfire at the jail, and they didn't know what had happened. The Carthage Greys were packing up camp. Levi Williams' men were scattering quickly. Until the citizens came upon the jail, there was no telling what had actually happened. Understandably, Many thought that the Mormons had attacked to break their prophet out of jail, but when they got to the jail, that notion was quickly corrected. As the mob scattered, they, they undoubtedly hollered out, you know, the prophet is dead, the damn rascal is shot, and all sorts of, you know, triumphant cries to anybody who was in earshot range. The scene of carnage at the jail in a dead Hiram and Joseph Smith meant only one thing. And that was exactly what everybody, including Governor Ford himself, believed when he departed for Nauvoo that morning. The Mormons may not be here in Carthage right now, but as soon as word made it to Nauvoo, they would be. The wrath of 3,500 religious zealots with nothing more to lose would descend on Carthage before daybreak, 
The city would be burned to the ground and the Mormons would salt the earth in their wake before moving on to Warsaw and doing the same thing. After five years of construction, the Mormon war machine was literally built for an occasion just like this. But could it run without a pilot, fueled only by the pure rage of vengeance and retribution? Quote, the moment the work was done, the calmness of horror succeeded the fever of fanatical rage. The assassins hurried away from the jail and took the road to Warsaw in silence and haste. They went home at a killing pace over the wide, dusty prairie. Warsaw is 18 miles from Carthage. The Smiths were killed at half past five. At a quarter before eight, the returning crowd began to drag their weary limbs through the main street of Warsaw. At such an astounding rate of speed had the lash of their own thoughts driven them. The town was instantly put in such attitude of defense as its limited means permitted. The women and children were ferried across the river to a village on the Missouri shore. The men kept guard night and day in the hazel thickets around the town. Everybody expected sudden and exemplary vengeance from the Mormons." End quote. The wife of the captain of the Carthage Greys remembers the weeks leading up to and the instant terror after gunfire was heard throughout her town. Uh, her husband, Robert F. Smith, was captain of the Greys who were tasked with guarding the city by Governor Ford. Now, General Deming oversaw the jail guard specifically. Robert F. Smith, no relation to Joseph Smith, Robert F. Smith was captain of the Carthage Greys that were guarding the, the rest of the entire city. He was also the justice of the peace who was overseeing the legal hearings during this whole affair. So he was understandably busy and possibly not the best guy to be captain over the Greys. A little conflict of interest there. Mrs. Robert F. Smith, and I wish I knew her, her actual name, but this is what she said, quote, that day, June 27, 1844, I was unusually depressed and out of sorts. I had been living in almost constant dread terror of the Mormons for years and never noon from day to day and hardly from one hour to another what dreadful catastrophe would happen. And when the rumor reached me about half past 2 p.m. that a mob had collected on the prairie some few miles out and were on the road to Carthage, some thought they were Mormons coming to liberate the Smiths from jail and would destroy the town and everything in it. My neighbors began to make preparations to leave their homes and their families, and the part of the town where I lived was soon entirely deserted but myself. My husband had not been home a single night for two weeks. He with his men had been keeping guard of the town day and night all that time. Now there's a there's some editorializing here, and I'm not sure where the editorializing comes from. It says she dressed and sent her six children to friends' houses one block away, and about an hour later she heard gunfire. And this is where she continues. I was powerless to move for a minute or two. When I became conscious, there was a Mormon girl who lived in the neighborhood standing in the door. I was holding on to the bench of my chair, and she was wringing her hands and saying, Oh my God, Mrs. Smith, they are shooting the men down at the jail and throwing them out of the window. All brought word of what terrible revenge the Mormons were going to take on the Carthage people for killing the Smiths. They were frightened and believed all the stories they heard. End quote. A word of what happened immediately hit every ear in Carthage if they didn't know from the gunfire. And every citizen began packing up and heading to Warsaw within the hour. Thomas L. Barnes was coroner of Carthage, and he immediately went to the jail to make his examination of the crime scene. He sent two letters to his daughter remembering the scene 50 years from when it happened, and he describes the, shoot the shootout and the situation in which he found the victims. And this is a bit of a long read, but this is the coroner himself. Quote, the attacking party forced the door open and commenced firing at Smith. It is said they must have hit him and probably disabled him as he staggered across the floor the opposite side of the room there where there was a window. It is said that there he gave the hailing sign of the distress of a mason, but that did him no good. In the room behind him was armed men, furious men, with murder in their hearts. Before him, around the well under the window, there was a crowd of desperate men, and he was receiving shots from behind which he could not stand. In desperation, he leaped, or rather fell, out of the window near the well where he breathed his last. 
When I found him soon afterwards, he was lying in the hall at the front of the stairs where his blood has, as I believe, left indelible stain on the floor. Taylor was severely wounded. Richards was not hurt. Shall I try to describe the wounds that Taylor received and got over them? Well, let me tell you where we found him. I cannot impress your mind of his appearance as he appeared to us when we were called to him by the jailer. We found him in a pile of straw. It appeared that the straw bed had been emptied in the cell where he was when we found him. He was very much frightened as well as severely wounded. It took strong persuading of the jailer as well as our positive assurance that we meant him no harm but was desirous of doing him some good. He finally consented to come out of the cell. The wounds had bled quite freely. The blood had had time to coagulate, which it had done. And where the clothes and straw came in contact, they all had adhered together. So that Mr. Taylor came out his self-sought cell, he was a pitiable-looking sight. We took the best care of him we could till he left us. He got well, but never paid us for skill or good wishes. After we were through with Taylor, I went to Richards and said to him, Richards, what does this mean? Who done it? said he, Doctor, I don't know, but I believe it was some Missourians that came over and have killed brothers Joseph and Hiram and wounded brother Taylor, said I to him. Do you believe that? He said, I do, says I. Will you write that down and send it to Nauvoo? He said he would if he could get any person to take it. I told him if he would write it, I would send it. He wrote the note. I found the man that took it to Nauvoo, end quote. So with the help of Coroner Thomas Barnes, the jailer, George Stegall, and the town's hotel manager, uh, owner, Artois Hamilton, Willard Richards conveyed the Smith bodies and the bleeding, nearly dying John Taylor to Hamilton Hotel just a few blocks away from the jail. And here they provided their examination and they stopped John Taylor's bleeding. It was important to get a message to Nauvoo. It was only a matter of time before word reached Nauvoo that Joe and Hiram were dead, that John Taylor was probably dead as well, and the whereabouts of Willard Richards were unknown. How the Mormons would respond was a question mark for everybody, even the Mormons themselves. If Willard Richards could get word to the Mormon leadership before any other messenger, he may be able to prevent the counties from devolving into immediate civil war, which many dreamed about but nobody actually wanted to happen. Complicating matters further, the leadership of the church was scattered all over the nation at this time, electioneering for Joe's presidential campaign. The centralized hierarchy of Mormonism was separated by hundreds or thousands of miles, and they could do nothing to coordinate and to handle and respond to the situation with any sense of deliberation or restraint. The people in Nauvoo who were high-ranking Mormon leaders, the men the Mormons would listen to, there was a scarce number of guys, and the men of the Nauvoo Legion would be thirsty for blood of the men who killed their prophet and patriarch. For all of these reasons and so many terrifying unknowns, Carthage became a ghost town. All of the citizens fled to Warsaw and then from Warsaw across the Mississippi to a small town in Missouri. Beyond that, Governor Ford was just wrapping up his public speech in Nauvoo at this same time, telling the Mormons that if anything happens that would interfere with the prosecution of their leaders, they, 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 the blame would be on the Mormons' head. A little more misbehavior and the whole state would burn Nauvoo to ash. For unknown reasons, while Governor Ford was giving his speech, a tension, a feeling of unease plagued the Mormon community. Samuel Smith, Joe's youngest surviving brother, rode out from Nauvoo, headed for Carthage, just a little bit ahead of Governor Ford and Governor Ford's detail. After nearly three hours of moving the bodies and examining them and stabilizing John Taylor, Willard Richards sat down to pen this note addressed to Governor Ford, General Jonathan Dunham, head of the Nauvoo Legion, Colonel Stephen Markham, who had been chased out of Carthage that morning, and Emma Smith, Joe's first wife, quote, Joseph and Hiram are dead. Taylor wounded. Not very badly. I am well. Our guard was forced, as we believe, by a band of Missourians from one to two hundred. The job was done in an instant and the party fled towards Nauvoo instantly. This is as I believe it. The citizens here are afraid of the Mormons attacking them. I promise them no, signed Willard Richards. N.B. The citizens promise us protection. Alarm guns have been fired. Signed, John Taylor. 
This letter was handed to the coroner, Thomas Barnes, who promised that he would get it to Nauvoo if Willard Richards would write it down. Thomas Barnes gave this letter to his brothers, William and John, who were understandably afraid to go to Nauvoo bearing such news, believing the Mormons are going to kill the messengers and then return to murder their whole families in Carthage. Those guys instead took the letter to an Arza Adams a few miles north of Carthage, who agreed to carry it with the help of a Benjamin Leyland who knew the roads and could avoid any troops on the road between Nauvoo and Carthage, be they Mormons or Mavocrats. Now, these men, Arza Adams and Benjamin Leyland, they set out for Nauvoo with Willard Richard's note around 9 p.m. But two men carrying the news without <laughs> Willard Richard's warning to not attack Carthage were already on their way to Nauvoo to spread the word. Two messengers just carrying verbal messages, just carrying the news with them, were a few hours ahead of this note that Willard Richards wrote. Governor Ford had left Nauvoo around 6 p.m., and he was headed with his detail toward Carthage, suspecting that an attack might be made. Now, Governor Ford left one of his boys, a Captain Singleton, in Nauvoo to basically control the Nauvoo Legion. And he met these two messengers on the road headed to Nauvoo. George D. Grant, a Mormon, and David Bettisworth, the Carthage constable who had arrest, who had all of the arrest warrants for Joe and the 17 other men who burned the expositor printing press, which led to this whole affair to begin with. George D. Grant and David, David Bettisworth were carrying the verbal communication, the news that Hiram and Joseph were dead, that John Taylor was probably dead, and that the whereabouts of Willard Richards were unknown. They were just a couple miles outside of Nauvoo when they were intercepted by Governor Ford and his men. This is how Governor Ford remembers it. Quote, A short time before sundown, we departed on our return to Carthage. When we had proceeded two miles, we met two individuals, one of them a Mormon, who informed us that the Smiths had been assassinated in jail about five or six o'clock that day. The intelligence seemed to strike everyone with a kind of dumbness. As to myself, it was perfectly astounding, and I anticipated the very worst consequences from it. The Mormons had been represented to me as a lawless, infatuated, and fanatical people, not governed by the ordinary motives which influence the rest of mankind. If so, most likely an exterminating war would ensue, and the whole land would be covered with desolation. Acting upon this supposition, it was my duty to provide as well as I could for the event. I therefore ordered the two messengers into custody, and to be returned with us to Carthage. This was done to get time to make such arrangements as could be made and to prevent any sudden explosion of Mormon excitement before they could be written to by their friends at Carthage. I also dispatched messengers to Warsaw to advise the citizens of the event, but the people there knew all about the matter before my messengers arrived. They, like myself, anticipated a general attack all over the country. The women and children were removed across the Mississippi River, and a committee was dispatched that night to Quincy for assistance, end quote. So Governor Ford, he intercepted these messengers who were carrying the verbal message to Nauvoo, not Willard Richard's written note to Nauvoo, and Governor Ford was now in complete damage control mode. For the moment, Hancock County was a contained oil fire. Now he just needed to keep it from spreading for the fires to actually catch and send the whole state into war. Governor Ford took these messengers into custody to prevent the message from getting to Nauvoo without the approval and without the whereabouts of John Taylor and Willard Richards. So he brought them back to Carthage with him. And the longer that he could keep the news from the Mormons, the more time he had to evacuate Carthage and to take control of the situation to suffocate those flames. Governor Ford and his men immediately went to Hamilton's hotel, where the bodies of... Hiram and Joseph Smith and an almost dead John Taylor lay under the care of Coroner Barnes and Willard Richards. They arrived around 10 p.m., where Governor Ford was able to get the story straight from the coroner and from Willard Richards himself. Joe's younger brother, Samuel Smith, had arrived at the hotel to see his dead older brothers just a little bit ahead of the governor and his men. 
Ford asked Willard Richards and Samuel Smith to pen an addendum to the message that Richard had sent earlier with Ars Adams and Benjamin Leyland in hopes that this second message would reassure the Mormons that an attack on Carthage was a terrible idea. Quote, to Mrs. Emma Smith and Major General Dunham, etc. The governor has just arrived, says all things shall be inquired to and all right measures taken. I say to all the citizens of Nauvoo, my brethren, be still and know that God reigns. Don't rush out of the city. Don't rush to Carthage. Stay at home and be prepared for an attack from Missouri mobbers. The governor will render every assistance possible, has sent out order for troops. Joseph and Hiram are dead, but not by the Carthage people. The guards were true, as I believe. We will prepare to move the bodies as soon as possible. The people of the country are greatly excited and fear the Mormons will come out and take vengeance. I have pledged my word that the Mormons will stay at home as soon as they can be informed and no violence will be on their part and say to my brethren in Nauvoo in the name of the Lord, be still, be patient. Only let such friends as choose come here to see the bodies. Mr. Taylor's wounds are dressed and not serious. I am sound. Signed, Willard Richards, John Taylor, Samuel H. Smith. And there is a postscript of the letter that says, Defend yourselves until protection can be furnished necessary. Dated June 27th, 1844. Signed, Thomas Ford, Governor and Commander-in-Chief. End quote. Governor Ford now had the unenviable task of keeping the peace, learning the facts, and commanding militias all over the state who had already committed mutiny or who held only the words of their dead supreme leader as the law. Governor Ford credits that letter that we just read as being the only thing that kept the Mormons from marching out and destroying Carthage and Warsaw that very night. Quote, here also I found Dr. Richards and John Taylor, two of the principal Mormon leaders who had been in jail at the time of the attack and who voluntarily addressed a most pacific exhortation to their fellow citizens, which was the first intelligence of the murder, which was received at Nauvoo. I think it very probable that the subsequent good conduct of the Mormons is attributable to the arrest of the messengers and to the influence of this letter, end quote. So Governor Ford released the messengers that he had taken into custody a few miles outside of Nauvoo, and Mormon George D. Grant immediately departed Carthage at a gallop, carrying this letter that Ford credits with keeping a lid on the state from exploding into civil war. George D. Grant came within two miles of Nauvoo. At the same time, another person in Nauvoo was acting on suspicions of foul play. Orrin, Pistol, Pack, and Porter Rockwell had been uneasy about Governor Ford's speech that evening, and he was unable to sleep. He decided to go to Carthage that night against the orders of Joseph Smith prior to their arrest, and he set to arrive in Carthage sometime before daybreak of June 28th. However, as Porter was about a mile and a half outside of Nauvoo on the road to Carthage, he ran into... George D. Grant, carrying the message that was penned by Richard Samuel Smith, John Taylor, and Governor Ford. George D. Grant told Pistol Pack and Porter what he knew of the situation in Carthage, and Porter's childhood friends from Palmyra, the men that Porter Rockwell had sworn absolute fealty to protect, they were dead. Who was in charge of the troops? Porter asked George Grant. Worrell! Frank Worrell! Grant replied breathlessly. The name of Frank Worrell would forever be burned into the mind of Porter Rockwell. After the conversation, Pistol Pack and Porter wheeled his horse around and sprinted for Nauvoo. George Grant's horse was exhausted from the gallop from Carthage. Porter's horse was still fresh. It was about three to four in the morning, and Porter reached the outskirts of Nauvoo, shouting at the top of his lungs. Joseph is killed! They've killed him! God damn him! They've killed him! Still a few hours before daybreak, Mormons slowly roused at the panicked shrieks from Porter and the thunderous pound of hooves as he canvassed every street in town to raise the alarm. This is Porter Rockwell's famous ride through Nauvoo, waking thousands of people from their slumber at three in the morning with the cry that they've killed the prophet, the named Frank Worrell, 
etched into the folds of his consciousness forever. Governor Ford had done enough to gain the trust of the Mormons through this whole affair. With the letter telling the Mormons to rest easy and let the governor handle it, co-signed by the governor himself, Joe's younger brother, Samuel Smith, and the two survivors of the attack, the intelligence spread through the Mormon community, causing a sense of uneasiness coupled with the turmoil and the despair of losing Joe and Hiram. Many people simply didn't believe it. Others thought that Governor Ford was responsible. Others were gearing up for an assault on Carthage in spite of the orders. Nauvoo was utter chaos. Governor Ford understood the mob made the attack exactly when he was in Nauvoo with the hopes that the Mormons would blame him and kill him on the spot. Quote, As for myself, I was well convinced that those, whoever they were, who assassinated the Smiths, meditated in turn my assassination by the Mormons. The very circumstances of the case fully corroborated the information which I afterwards received, that upon consultation of the assassins, it was agreed amongst them that the murder must be committed whilst the governor was in Nauvoo, that the Mormons would naturally supposed that he had planned it, and that in the first outpouring of their indignation, they would assassinate him by way of retaliation, and that thus they would get clear of the Smiths and the governor all at once. They also supposed that if they could so contrive the matter as to have the governor of the state assassinated by the Mormons, the public excitement would be greatly increased against that people and would result in their expulsion from the state at least. End quote. It was the plan all along. Murder Joe and Hiram while Governor Ford was in Carthage, then send a messenger to Nauvoo before Ford left with the knowledge of the murder and the Mormons would retaliate by murdering Governor Ford like they had done with Governor Boggs. And then the anti-Mormons would point to Ford's assassination and use it as a rally cry against the Mormons to drive them out of Illinois. The Mormons existed in a state of confusion and mourning, but the anti-Mormons in Carthage and Warsaw sought to capitalize on the public confusion by weaving their own narrative. Notably, within five hours after the gunfight in jail, Carthage was almost completely a ghost town and all the people fled to Warsaw or were ferried across the Mississippi from Warsaw to Missouri, as Missouri would provide complete and absolute protection against the Mormons. Thomas Sharp, who may have been part of the attack or may not have been, the evidence is inconclusive, printed his own version of events in an extra of the Warsaw Signal, The Night of the Gunfight, which was immediately circulated beginning around 9 to 10 that same night. The anti-Mormons began controlling the narrative using propaganda within hours of the event happening, claiming that it all started by a Mormon trying to break the prisoners out of the jail. Now remember, it was the Warsaw Signal in Thomas Sharp's own words, which had initially called on the citizens to exterminate the Mormons. That was the end game here. The governor of Illinois, in the, the mind of you know, Levi Williams, Thomas Sharp, the governor of Illinois was merely a sacrificial pawn in this game if all went according to their plan. Quote, extra, Joe and Hiram Smith are dead, shot this afternoon. An attack from the Mormons is expected every hour. Will not the surrounding counties rush instantly to our rescue? It seems that the circumstances attended the killing of the Mormon prophet and his brother Hiram are as follows. On yesterday, Governor Ford left Carthage with about 120 soldiers for the purpose of taking possession of the Nauvoo Legion and their arms. They arrived at Nauvoo about noon and called for assembling of the Legion and their arms. They arrived at Nauvoo about noon and called for the assembling of the Legion. About 2,000 men with arms immediately responded to the call. These troops were put under the command of Colonel Singleton of the Brown County, who accompanied Governor Ford to Nauvoo. The governor, finding all quiet, left Nauvoo about 5 o'clock p.m. with a company of 60 men for the purpose of encamping about seven miles from the city. At about the same time that Governor Ford left Nauvoo, the prophet and his brother were killed at Carthage under the following circumstances as near as we can ascertain them. Joe and Hiram Smith are both confined in the debtor's room of the Carthage jail, awaiting their trial on charge of treason. The jail was strongly guarded by soldiers and anti-Mormons who had been placed there by the governor. A Mormon attempted to rush by the guards for the purpose of forcing his way in the jail. He was opposed by the guard and fired a pistol at one of the guards, giving him a slight wound. The general confusion ensued in the crowd around the jail. Joe and his fellow Mormon prisoners, it seemed, had provided themselves with pistols and commenced firing upon the guards within. He then attempted to escape by the window when a hundred balls entered his body and he fell a lifeless corpse. His brother Hiram shared the same fate. 
Richards, a leading Mormon, was badly wounded. There, our intelligence ends. What took place after this, God only knows. Mormons immediately left for Nauvoo to carry the news of the death of the prophet. It is feared that the Mormons at Nauvoo will be so exasperated as to exterminate the governor and his small force. The Boreas, that's a steamer, the Boreas brought down most of the women and children from Warsaw, actually Carthage. It is feared that their town is in ashes before this. Our citizens were aroused this morning by the ringing of bells and a call to arms. Our three independent companies are already in marching orders. Major Flood has ordered out the militia of his regiment, and the steamer Boreas is waiting to convey them to the scene of action. There is no knowing what this dreadful affair will end. Many have expressed fears that our city is in danger because most of the Carthage families have taken refuge here. But we believe there is no danger. We are too far from the scene of action. Messengers have just left for Hannibal and the towns below for the purpose of arousing the Missourians. The excitement in our city is intense and the anxiety to hear the fate of Governor Ford and his men are very great. End quote. And just like that, the beginning of the propaganda war was kicked into motion. It became the cry of the anti-Mormons that the Mormons stormed the jail to break out the prisoners and the prisoners were killed to prevent their escape. There's absolutely no evidence for this. And the person writing the article, Thomas Sharp, knew it was a lie when he printed it. Governor Reford reflects on this time with a great deal of wisdom and calculation as he attempted to balance mutually opposed interests of the Mormons and the anti-Mormons. Quote, the citizens of Warsaw, like myself, anticipated a general attack all over the country. The women and children were removed across the river, and a committee was dispatched that night to Quincy for assistance. The next morning, by daylight, the ringing of the bells in the city of Quincy announced a public meeting. The people assembled in great numbers at an early hour. The Warsaw Committee stated to the meeting that a party of Mormons had attempted to rescue the Smiths out of jail, that a party of Missourians and others had killed the prisoners to prevent their escape, that the governor and his party were at Nauvoo at the time when intelligence of the fact was brought there, that they had been attacked by the Nauvoo Legion and had retreated to a house where they were then closely besieged, that the governor had sent out word that he could maintain his possession for two days and would be certain to be massacred if assistance did not arrive by the end of that time. It is unnecessary to say that this entire story was a fabrication. It was a piece with the other reports put into circulation by the anti-Mormon party to influence the public mind and call the people to their assistance. The effect of it, however, was that by 10 o'clock on the 28th of June, between two and 300 men from Quincy, under the command of Major Flood, embarked on board of a steamboat for Nauvoo to assist in raising the siege as they honestly believed. Upon hearing of the assassination of the Smiths, I was sensible that my command was at an end, that my destruction was meditated as well as that of the Mormons, and that I could not reasonably confide longer in one party or in the other. The question then arose, what would be proper to be done? A war was expected by everybody. I was desirous of preserving the peace. I could not put myself at the head of the Mormon force with any kind of propriety and without exciting greater odium against them than already existed. I could not put myself at the head of the anti-Mormon party because they had justly forfeited my confidence and my command over them was put an end to by mutiny and treachery. I could not put myself at the head of either of these forces because both of them in turn had violated the law and, as I then believed, meditated further aggression. It appeared to me that if a war ensued... I ought to have a force in which I could confide, and that I ought to establish my headquarters at a place where I could learn the truth as to what was going on, end quote. So Governor Ford, understanding that he could trust nobody, resolved that Quincy would be the location that he would post up and try to keep the tensions from exploding beyond that point. And he arrived in Quincy on the morning of June 29th, the day which was on the docket book to hold the hearing for the Smith brothers on charges of riot and treason against the United States. Governor Ford also notes that even though the Smith brothers were dead, quote, it appeared that the anti-Mormon party had not relinquished their hostility to the Mormons, nor their determination to expel them, end quote. But he also notes that the time of year bought him a little bit of time to get things in order and to calm down the tensions, quote, but the anti-Mormons had deferred further operations until the fall season after they had finished their summer's work on their farms, end quote. As Governor Ford was organizing his men for the trip to Quincy from Carthage, 
Willard Richards commissioned Artois Hamilton, the owner of the hotel where the bodies had been taken, and Richards was helping Taylor to stabilize and recover. He commissioned Artois Hamilton to build two pine boxes for the bodies. They were completed by 7 in the morning of June 28th, and it was a sleepless night for everybody involved, except probably for John Taylor, who Dr. Richards undoubtedly gave something to put him to sleep so he could try and sleep through the pain. And with the help of Artois Hamilton and the younger Smith brother Samuel, Willard Richards placed the bodies of Hiram and Joseph in these pine boxes and then placed them in two wagons and left Carthage for Nauvoo about 8 a.m. General Deming, who had been tasked by the governor to oversee the jail guard operations and fled when Levi's troops entered the city to attack the jail, Deming gave the men a detachment of eight armed soldiers to escort the bodies to Nauvoo, which they covered with tree branches to protect from the sun. There was also a bounty on the actual heads of Joseph and Hiram Smith, $500 a piece. So they had to protect the bodies. Now, the Nauvoo City Marshal, John P. Green, organized the procession to receive the bodies in Nauvoo. The wagons and the escort arrived in Nauvoo at about 3 p.m., where, quote, several thousands of the citizens were there amidst the most solemn lamentations and wailings that ever ascended into the ears of the Lord of hosts to be avenged of their enemies, end quote. As the thousands of people received the wagon train, quote, Dr. Richards admonished the people to keep the peace, stating that he had pledged his honor and his life for their good conduct. When the people with one united voice resolved to trust to the law for a remedy of such a high handed assassination. And when that failed to call upon God to avenge them of their wrongs. O oh, Americans weep for the glory of freedom has departed, end quote. The bodies were taken to the Nauvoo mansion, where Dimmick B. Huntington, William Brutus Marks, remember a Brutus and a Judas, William Marks, and William D. Huntington washed and examined the bodies. They noted, quote, Joseph was shot in the right breast, also under the heart, in the lower part of his bowels on the right side, and on the big wrinkle on the back part of his right hip. One ball had come out at the right shoulder blade. End quote. During this time, George Cannon made a plaster cast of the faces of Hiram and Joe, from which he made two copies of their death masks. The bullet wound to Hiram's face above his left nostril can be seen as a blemish on his death mask today in the Church History Museum. The governor does spend a bit of time kind of commenting on the immense pressures surrounding his handling of this situation, pressures which extended far beyond the Mormon and anti-Mormons into the national political sphere. Quote, I had scarcely arrived at the scene of action before the Whig press commenced the most violent abuse and attributed to me the most basest motives. It was alleged in the Sangamo Journal and repeated in other Whig newspapers that the governor had merely gone over to cement an alliance with the Mormons, that the leaders would not be brought to punishment, but that a full privilege would be accorded to them to commit crimes of every hue and grade in return for their support of the Democratic Party. I mention this not by way of complaint, for it is only the privilege of the minority to complain, but for its influence upon the people. I observed that I was narrowly watched in all my proceedings by my Whig fellow citizens and was suspected of an intention to favor the Mormons. I felt that I did not possess the confidence of the men I commanded and that they had been induced to withhold it by the promulgation of the most abominable falsehoods. I felt the necessity of possessing their confidence in order to give vigor to my action and exerted myself in every way to obtain it so that I could control the excited multitude who were under my command. I succeeded better for a time than could have been expected, but who can control the action of a mob without possessing their entire confidence? It is true also that some unprincipled Democrats all the time appear to be very busy on the side of the Mormons, and this circumstance was well calculated to increase suspicions of everyone who had the name of Democrat, end quote. 
there were so many motives, Mormon, anti-Mormon, political and otherwise, that Governor Ford had to try and balance here. And his group of trusted militia commanders constantly shrunk around him as the situation escalated and loyalties were tried. He bore the blame in the mind of every Mormon for the deaths of Joe and Hiram when I can barely see an error in his decision making. He bore the blame from the non-Mormons for being too cozy with the Mormons. He was blamed by his Whig political opponents for trying to just curry votes and then blamed by the Democrats for sullying their name. The Democrats were the slaveholders at the time, and they were like, hey, Tommy Ford, you're giving us a bad rap by all this Mormon business. Like, maybe, maybe Thomas Ford shouldn't have left Carthage for Nauvoo that morning, but, like, he needed to meet with the Mormons and to convey to them the seriousness of the situation, which he couldn't do with the force of his own voice through emissaries. So Governor Ford catches the blame for both his actions and for perceived inactions, and I don't think it's fair. Similarly, Thomas Sharp catches a lot of blame for the fire that he constantly spewed through the Warsaw Signal, and I don't think it's totally fair either because his articles about the Mormons were reactionary, not proactive. He published in response to what was done by the Mormons or intel that he received that the Mormons didn't want the rest of the world to know. And to be even more fair to Sharp, Joe constantly attacked Thomas Sharp and the Warsaw Signal as lies and fake news through the Mormon propaganda outlets, the Times and Seasons, the Wasp, the Nauvoo Neighbor. The best that Thomas Sharp could do to retaliate was more print about the Mormons. And maybe Thomas Sharp constantly attacking the Mormons or, you know, printing information about them that was not favorable, maybe that fueled the Mormon persecution complex because he was basically platforming them. But Would it have been better for him to completely ignore the dangerous ideas and motivations of the Mormon theocracy? That's a prescient discussion which transcends any individual examples of despotism or populism like Mormonism. The Federalist Papers discuss populism extensively because it's far from a modern phenomenon. Now, some people also want to blame the Missourians because the public mind about the Mormons was so deeply shaped and warped by what happened there in 1838 The many people believe that it was the same mobocratic spirit that carried from Missouri to Illinois that spurned all of this anti-Mormon rhetoric and publications that eventually led to this Carthage gunfight. And that's a fair point to make in the abstract, but that point is rendered meaningless when it's viewed in the larger context. The reason that the anti-Mormon sentiment was similar in Missouri and Illinois is because the Mormons were doing the same lawless and theocratic stuff in both states. Which brings me to my final focus here. Joseph Smith. Most people who learn the story of Carthage see Joseph as the victim, a persecuted religious leader attempting to bring the light and knowledge of the one true gospel to the world who was removed at the time the Lord saw fit for his greater plan of restoring the ancient church to the world, which was lost through the great apostasy. And yeah, religious persecution is certainly a component to what happened, but it was such an ancillary issue when compared with everything else Joseph Smith did to absolutely and unequivocally deserve the public castigation. The real tragedy here is that he brought thousands of people along that journey of perceived persecution causing pain and anguish, turmoil, abuse, disease, and bloodshed. His followers were his victims. But such is the plight of those who attach their identity to an unapologetic monster, an, a populist tyrant like Joseph Smith. He was a wolf in wolves' clothing that caused the suffering of thousands of people for the sole purpose of personal aggrandizement. People want to blame Tom Ass Sharp, Governor Ford, Levi Williams, Frank Worrell, or even Governor Boggs for what happened in Carthage. But every person trying to do so is wrong. They're not just wrong, they're deluded to believe that they're right and nothing's going to change that belief. Religion poisons everything. And if Joe wasn't a religious leader, he would live in infamy as a militant demagogue, a tyrant who was assassinated while running for president of the United States. But because he's not just a tyrant, but 
the first prophet of this dispensation, who translated unknown texts into scripture and revealed the plain and precious doctrines of the nature of God and the universe. He created the one true religion, nay, the last religion this world will ever need before the second coming of the Savior. Joe gets a free pass on theft, on plagiarism, on murder, on adultery, on violating his own commandments, forming assassin squads or secret combinations, if you will, committing treason, committing murder, burning entire villages to the ground during campaigns of pillaging and raping children. He's not guilty of any of those crimes. He simply operates by the law of the Lord, not, not, not the law of the land. Joseph Smith was the worst kind of tyrant, the religious kind. But I suppose rarely are tyrants completely absent some kind of religious component. The simple fact is, if Joe's legacy were attached to somebody who wasn't a religious leader, he'd be overwhelmingly condemned by any human being with a modicum of humanistic morality. While we're casting blame around the room for Joe's death, how about we put it where it belongs, on the man himself? He was clearly the problem. He was the agitator. He was the reason for all of the perceived persecution, all of the pain and suffering experienced by thousands of people, now tens of millions of people. All of that happened because of his own actions spurned by his own desires. The great Mormon war machine that he had built for nearly a decade and a half was suddenly left without a pilot. Thousands of people were now directionless and left at the mercy of a tiny cabal of self-righteous, professed holy men to use these people as trading cards for the next Mormon exodus. It's all a game. It was all a game from the beginning, as much as it's a game today, and we all got played just like the Nauvoo Mormons. Now, a final point to deal with here. A lot of people want to put the blame for this on Bloody Brigham Young. Now, let's deal with this pervasive little coup d'etat conspiracy theory quickly. No, Brigham Young was 1,200 miles away holding a conference. For him to have any hand in what happened in Carthage, he'd have to be responsible to some extent for the Nauvoo Expositor, for the city council meeting which resolved to destroy the Expositor, for the riots that followed, for the arrest warrants filed by the circuit judge at Carthage, and for everything that followed that that led to Carthage jail. He'd also need to have instantaneous communication with Governor Ford, Colonel Levi Williams, Thomas Sharp, Stephen Markham, Frank Worrell, and oh, a ton of other people that would have to be wrapped up and know about this conspiracy. And that, that instantaneous communication wouldn't exist for at least a couple more decades. Brigham Young coordinating messages for that far, that's 1,200 miles, it, it would take weeks. The dude didn't even know that the Nauvoo Expositor was published when he received the news that Joe and Hiram were dead two weeks after it happened. That's how long it took for news to spread across the nation. Uh, oh, maybe Brigham Young was, he wasn't actually in Boston and, and it was all a ruse and he was actually part of the mob. And that's why Willard Richards survived because Willard Richards was a close confidant of Brigham Young and his cousin and he didn't want him to die, but everybody else caught the bullets and he promised to John Taylor that he would be profit if he survived it. Uh, okay, you know what? No. Brigham Young was meeting people out in Boston. He was organizing a general conference to be held there in early July. There are literally journal entries of the people with whom he was meeting, other members of the Quorum of Apostles. Look, okay, so I'll, I'll say this. It's not impossible, you know, like the Book of Mormon or the Book of Abraham being what Joe claimed them to be. It's not impossible that Brigham Young was a culprit or a conspirator in the Carthage assassinations. It's just exceptionally unlikely. So let's cut that crap out, okay? There's plenty about Bloody Brigham Young worth hating without him being responsible for Joe's death. Um, although, in some ways, you know, for me personally, that'd be a bit of a redeeming quality. Look, Brigham Young, he doesn't have his nickname Bloody Brigham because your host, Bryce Blankenegel, just likes alliteration. So then, let's now that's dealt with. The question then remains... How does this resolve? How do you prosecute a vigilante mob for issuing the death penalty to a person who deserved it when that execution was effected without the sanction of a court? Who bears responsibility? What is the punishment for vigilantism? And a more foundational question precedes those. How do we bring a tyrant to justice when he's proven himself legally immune how do you break the iron grip of populism 
when all it does is cause harm to unwitting victims who tirelessly work to advance populism. Once a movement reaches critical mass, how do you fracture the bad ideas which underpin it? Well, by virtue of my existence and millions of former Mormons since the church began, those questions obviously remain unanswered, but they're dire and perfectly timeless questions to ponder, or to skepticize, if you will. Every major biography of Joseph Smith ends here. The bodies are brought back to Nauvoo, the assailants are all acquitted, and the concluding chapter brings to a close the life and legacy of the inimitable Joseph Smith by waxing poetic about how awesome the gospel is, or, you know, maybe interjecting pithy lines about how horrible of a guy he was. Yeah, Joe is now dead in our nearly six-year historical timeline, and good riddance, fuck that guy, because he fucked everybody, but I can't help but have some complicated thoughts on this. But that'll have to wait until next week because we have to talk about all of the vast and multifaceted consequences of what happened the day that Joe and Hiram died. For the past two months, I've also been collecting accounts from a number of people who are connected with all of this because it's important to see how those people felt and reacted to the gunfight in Carthage. Needless to say, it's incredibly disappointing to learn how complicated the story really is and compare it to the 15-minute tour that you get when you're walking through Carthage Jail or, you know, in family home evening lessons or church lessons about the martyrdom. There are real stories and lessons to take from all of this that make us question society and humanity and the way that we humans deal with marginalized people and lawlessness and tyranny and oppression and persecution and policing and warfare and law and disorder. That's all for next week when we bury Joe and prosecute those responsible. Hope to talk to you next time here on the Naked Mormonism Podcast.
This podcast is produced with the help of Julie Briscoe as social media manager. Music is written and produced by Jason Camo of a lost state of mind bandcamp.com and used with permission. Legal counsel is provided by Andrew Torres of the law offices of P. Andrew Torres in the opening arguments podcast. Naked Mormonism is a production of Ground Gnomes LLC. Copyright 2020. All rights reserved.